Well, um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm a new postdoc here at Berkeley, um, working in the AMP Lab. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, a particular class of applications that I think are going to be increasingly um, kind of important and applicable to the MMDS universe. Um, the, the text on the workshop slide, or the workshop badge here says, algorithms for modern massive data sets. And I'm not, the algorithms I'm going to talk about today are kind of at the forefront of things that we would like to scale. And in some sense, part of my reason for, for coming to Berkeley and wanting to work with people like um, Ben Recht and Mike is that they're kind of the, the experts in taking kind of classes of rich expressive models, uh, think, um, deterministic or even probabilistic models, and trying to understand how to extend them to data sets that really matter. And why is this important? Why am I talking about kind of discovering this data in neuroscience? Well, when I started off as a kid, I was like, well, what I'd really like to do is understand how the most advanced hardware in the known universe works. And if you're a kid like me of the 90s, well, you might have thought that that's some sort of spaceship that's going to fall in from the sky. But in reality, it's a chunk of organic matter with the consistency of jello. And we each walk around with it every day, but it has 85 billion computing units and roughly a trillion interconnections. So it looks in many ways very different, at least from a connectivity standpoint, from what we're used to working with kind of as computer scientists, as electrical engineers. Um, but there's kind of something for everyone, especially if you're in kind of the, the EECS universe, right? There's device physics where you're like, well, I have these neural computing units. Each of them has literally uh, uh, hundreds of different types of receptors and channels, each with their own membrane tying constant. So every neuron itself becomes this very complicated little electronic circuit that makes our kind of traditional, you know, 22 nanometer silicon um, look very, very simplistic by comparison. There are these incredible architectural challenges, and I'm going to talk about that in particular a little bit today, where how do you start wiring up these sorts of units? How does biology kind of given only, let's say, roughly 4 billion bits, um, or actually, a, a, yeah, roughly 4 billion bits of DNA, describe something, a graph with roughly, you know, a trillion edges? And it's not just describing that graph, it's got to do whatever the rest of this is here. And once you've started designing those sorts of computational primitives, you know, how do you start analyzing them? How do they actually process the information, both at kind of the sensory or physiology level, where you know, I'm streaming in gigabits of data through my eyes right now, and ultimately turning it into some sort of you know, scalar waveform output with my voice. But also the side that, that, that I think is increasingly becoming important is, is how do you start acquiring that data? And that's where the, the MM part comes in. Because increasingly, neuroscientists are starting to recover um, you develop the ability to record from kind of hundreds of neurons, thousands of neurons. Eventually, the goal is to record from millions of neurons simultaneously. The Obama administration last year announced this initiative to, for I think it's roughly $3 billion over 10 years, try and tackle a lot of these sorts of projects. And yet, the reality is we still basically know nothing. And with apologies to my, my, my neuroscience colleagues, um, every time you see something exciting in Newsweek with some sort of fMRI data, and you're like, oh, this part of the brain lights up, or scientists say that they found a cell that does X, or, or a, a gene that does Y. As computer scientists, you should think that's kind of like someone saying, well, I found the transistor that does X, or maybe the line of code that does Y. We all recognize those are just such incredible simplifications. And so you start thinking, well, if I really want to understand these sorts of systems, and I come from an engineering background, I guess the first thing I'm going to want is some sort of schematic. And we don't even really have that yet, right? Here we are in 2014, we're waiting for the future, and yet, we're trying to put together these schematics of how brains are connected. And we're doing that at various scales, right? So there's a technology called diffusion tensor MRI, which is getting, uh, developing the ability to non-invasively, which is very important when you're working with humans. Um, I sound kind of sad about that fact, but no, it's a good thing. You don't want to be sticking wires in your head. Um, discover kind of the, the in some sense, the, the tables of Cat5 that are connecting the different processing centers in our brain. So it's a very coarse gra granularity, but it's showing kind of this global connectivity. We have a very exciting collection of molecular and genetic techniques that are letting us start to, call, for example, in this case, this project called Brainbow, stochastically label different neurons different colors such that we can tr try and trace where they go. And we can even, um, no, I do not want to be connected to AT and Wi-Fi. Um, but the gold standard right now, if you're trying to reconstruct these uh, uh, connectivity, the, 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 the approach to do these sorts of kind of connectomic-like reconstructions, because everything is more fundable if you put the word ohm after it, is to take a brain or take some section of a brain and 
slice it into incredibly thin slices. So we're literally talking like tens of nanometers here, right? And then image that entire volume with extremely high throughput scanning electron microscopy, giving you images that look like what you see up here in the upper right hand corner. And from that, you try and recapitulate with a complicated array of computer vision algorithms. And right now, currently, somewhat tragically, a tremendous amount of human labor. Um, the data set I'll be showing today um, was a result of, I believe, 80,000 man hours of additional human annotation. These sorts of connectivity diagrams, because just as your underlying x86 is really the product of its connectivity, these neural systems, at the very least, are incredibly dependent upon their patterns of interconnections. And what you see down here on the right is an example of one of these connectomics data sets. So in fact, this particular data set um, was kind of the, the first um, of the modern era of this sort that was released um, in September of last year, where they took a single um, cubic volume from a mouse retina and attempted to, see, uh, attempted to map all the connections between all the cells in that volume. Now, it's important to note that that volume itself is very small. Um, and we were able to get, I say we as if, I, I was not on the data acquisition side, the, the people on the project were able to get roughly 1,000 cells and their interconnections. And what you're seeing down here on the right is the kind of complicated rat's nest where each sphere is actually a cell body, and then the dendritic interconnections are all shown in that exciting mess. Now, the reason why this is exciting and the reason why I'm here is that someday this will be big data. In fact, someday this will be kind of the, the, the data set scales that, that make the, all of our attempts to sequence the human genome look very small, right? The, the underlying entropy in these systems, well, we don't really have, we haven't really even been able to quantify it yet. But the assumption is that it's very large and that because these systems kind of both have evolved to do very complicated things that we still don't really understand, right? You know, AI still totally escapes us. And also because there's all this activity dependence. I mean, imagine if your computer were continually rewiring itself over the two or three years that you had it. And when you take it to the Mac store and they then like fix it, you basically get like a new baby again. That would be very frustrating. They do sometimes do something close to that. It's very upsetting. So neuroscientists have known for a long time that these systems actually are connected in kind of various things that look like, you might imagine, canonical microcircuits. And what we're showing over here is, um, are effectively some hand tracings done at the turn of the century um, from different sections of neural tissue. The far left is uh, visual cortex of the adult, then we have the motor cortex of adult and kind of cortical structures of infants. And you can already see from, again, this is, this is stuff that was done long before my grandparents were alive, um, that there appear to be different cell types. That is, there appear to be kind of these little individual neuron things here that are ba barely able to trace out have kind of different morphology associated with them. But in addition to that, the different cellular areas, right, the different bra um, brain areas, also appear to have different patterns of connectivity. And you even see that there appears to be substantial in some sense striking connectivity differences between adults and um, new, um, um, newborns. And this led to a lot of investigation. In the 1950s, um, some very famous work was done that showed that in fact, in the cortex, in kind of the large um, um, outer area of your brain where the majority of, of kind of advanced stuff lies, mammalian neurons live, there appears to be this repeating organizing principle of cortical columns. That is, there, it appears that there's kind of this canonical microcircuit that's kind of stamped out tessellating space and then is interconnected through kind of various layers of connectivity, right? So all these structures are laminar. Biology really likes making layers of stuff. And you can even see that again in the, the hand drawings over on the left there. And this shouldn't be terribly surprising from a um, computer architecture perspective because, of course, we as computer architects are very good at building canonical microcircuits as well. And what you see here are the different silicon layers interconnected um, for a clocked register in kind of a commodity ASIC. Um, it's not actually, I guess, I shouldn't call it commodity these days. This is from the original MOS 6502 um, from the Apple One. So what we really wanted to build was a probabilistic model that could go from this kind of dense connectivity data and extract out what the microcircuitry looked like, understand what those underlying cell types were, right? Because just as in a human, computer, human built computer where you have uh, registers and flip flops and ALUs and, 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 and um, AND gates and OR gates and all these kind of other computing primitives, similarly, these cell types suggest that biology has in some sense specialized the computing units for their role. So, Having spent too many years at MIT, I have this kind of um, unapologetically Bayesian, and the question to ask 
from our perspective is what is our prior distribution? That is, what are the beliefs that we want to bake into this particular probabilistic model when we try to try and learn this sort of stuff from the data? And you know, stating it like this, if you're trying to build algorithms for biologists and for kind of the, the, the working scientists, actually becomes incredibly important because the first thing they want to know is, well, okay, you built this thing that finds patterns in data, but what did you tell it? What did you break, bake in? And we didn't bake in very much at the end of the day. We said, well, okay, we think that cells have types. So we have this graph, and associated with each node in the graph is going to be some latent unobserved type. We don't know what that type is. In fact, that's one of the things we'd like to learn. But we really strongly believe that there exists type-specific type or type-dependent interconnectivity. And we also think that the distance between these cells matters, which you, know, you can imagine if you have a brain, it's not a fully connected graph, obviously. Um, and in fact, there tends to be a lot of local connectivity. And you see these kind of local connectivity patterns anytime you try and embed something that looks like a graph in real space where there's a cost to communicating to your neighbors. Um, we're also going to say that in some sense, we think that there's a particular, remember they said these layers are laminar, we think that there's a depth profile associated with the inputs. So just as you, know, you might, if you're building a, a rack in a data center, have different levels at which you're running Cat5, the brain appears to have kind of these sorts of synaptic uh, um, uh, density profiles as well. And we're also going to say that, well, and we also think, in fact, types tend to be localized to a particular layer. Like, just as you might put all your APC power units at the bottom of your rack, similarly, there, the, the, in some sense, the, the 100 years of, of neuroanatomy knowledge of what even constitutes a type is a func it strongly includes this laminarity information. But let's just start with what is our data. So we're taking in the following. We're taking in a connectivity matrix that shows how all these cells interconnect, as well as the distance matrix, which is the one right behind it, which just says, shows how far away are the cell bodies from one another. And every time I give this talk, biologists are like, well, you know, the distance between cell bodies is a shitty distance metric. It's true. Um, there are certainly much more complicated things we could do. This was a, 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 what we were hoping for was a reasonable first pass. We're also taking in the depth of the soma, that is the depth of the primary cell body. So you remember um, from kind of AP biology that a neuron itself is a, a cell body that then has this kind of output cable in some sense, this axon that goes off someplace to project um, and transmit information. But then it also has all these inputs, this tree-like dendritic arbor. And various neurons have very, like, like conform to that model to varying degrees, but it's a totally reasonable um, first pass proxy. And then that dendritic arbor has a certain, um, tends to have a certain shape. It tends to take inputs at certain uh, points in it and tends to have output, or tends to then not take inputs from other layers. And so we're going to model all of this with what, we're what is effectively an extension of a probabilistic model developed by kind of the, the social science community called the stochastic block model. And the underlying simple idea here is that each cell has some unobserved type. And the connectivity only really depends upon those latent types. Or at least the classic stochastic block model just says, all that really matters is types connect with types. And the example I always like to use there, there, there is, say you're at a conference and what you've observed is that person A has tried to talk to, per, person I has tried to talk to person J. That is, you've watched people go up and try and talk to one another. The nice thing about try and talk is it's not symmetric, right? I might try and talk to uh, a faculty member and they'll just walk away. Um, has actually happened. But, what you'd like to do is go from this connectivity diagram here to some sort of understanding, or this talking diagram here, I guess, to some sort of understanding. And if you permute the rows and columns of this matrix properly, you end up with a block structure that looks like this. And you're like, well, that's interesting. What does this really mean? Well, what you've really discovered here is that there exist kind of four types of people at, at academic conferences. There are undergrads, grad students, postdocs, and faculty. Undergrads all want to talk to faculty, obviously, but sometimes they get confused and think postdocs are faculty. I don't really complain about that too much. Graduate students just want to talk to graduate students and faculty. Postdocs just want to talk to postdocs because hell with everyone else. And then faculty ideally would just talk to faculty. We can formalize a model like this by saying that, okay, there exists some number of these latent types here, K. And for each entity in this matrix, um, there's an assignment, or there exists an assignment vector that assigns to each entity, entity in this matrix some group K. There's some set of global parameters, but what we're really trying to learn here at the end of the day is this latent matrix here, eta, that says um, the probability between, of, of a connection between type M and type N is something, right? So in this case, the probability of a faculty member trying to talk to a faculty member is close to one, because they tend to be fairly insular. Um, but I'm never getting a job. Um, the, 
challenge then becomes for a lot of these models, well, but one of the things we want to learn is how many of these types are, they, are there. So we take this kind of infinite non-parametric extension where we basically put a prior on how many groups are there, right? So we say, well, we don't know how many latent classes there are, but using this kind of Chinese restaurant process metaphor, this, this Dirichlet process prior, we can say, well, there might be as many latent types as there are data points, right? Maybe there are a thousand. I don't think so. In fact, I think that there's probably a small number. Um, combining that complexity prior then with this idea of distance between cells, right? So we're going to say, okay, at the end of the day, we think another thing that we want to incorporate into this model is, well, my probability of, in some sense, if going back to the talking analogy, my probability of talking to another graduate student is um, not only a function of whether or not we're both graduate students, but a function of how far apart we are, because, again, surprise, graduate students can be lazy. Um, we're going to model those sorts of interconnections with these kind of GLM style uh, link functions, right? So the, uh, if you look in the upper right hand or the upper left hand corner there, we're going to say for any two given latent types, each is going to be associated with one of these probability of connection um, curves where once they're closer than a certain amount, the connection probability goes up dramatically. Um, and even in graphs where we're not just observing straight up connectivity, but say the number of connections, right? We can easily map this into something where like what you're really modeling here explicitly is the Poisson rate or some, so some count model. But at the end of the day, the idea is the same. The closer things are, the more likely they are to talk to each other. I'll talk a little bit later about kind of the ramifications of the monotonicity assumption here. We then take these kind of classic models and we extend them with two things. One is this notion of depth mattering, right? So we're going to say each cell has some latent depth that we don't know about. Um, um, and that cell type tries to, or is preferentially localized. And additionally, um, each cell type has some particular depth profile of its input. So you can imagine one way of looking at this is kind of the thing on the left is modeling where the, the, the actual cell body lies, and the thing on the right says this is the spatial distributions of inputs along this kind of z-axis. And the recovered latent structure that we're looking for is exactly this, right? It's this organization of the underlying uh, connectivity matrix where we say, well, some groups are more, probable, uh, more likely to connect to other groups with certain distance parameters. Um, and there ends up additionally being this kind of localization of um, density profile and cell body location. So just as a recap, we start with this input data up here, which is this connectivity information recovered from these painstaking attempts to recapitulate uh, this these connectomes in these neural systems. We go through all this algorithmic, uh, this amazing algorithmic stuff that's um, then going to give us connectivity diagrams that are, of course, fun and interesting to visualize. Um, the way I've started liking to do it is with these great plots that I've stolen entirely from the molecular biology community. Man, those guys have been on top of visualization for like 20 years. It's great. Um, because what you'd like to show is, you know, it's hard to interpret sometimes these uh, um, stochastic block matrices that, are, are, that have this block structure. So instead, we'd like to say, well, we know that these are the types, right? So we've identified in this case these, these kind of five types. We've identified that the cell bodies and the synapse densities are... are, are similar in the following ways. And then we'd like to look at how that connectivity varies as distance, as these cells are further and further apart. So this figure H down here, you see that when it's close, there's actually a lot of connectivity. And as things get further and further away, you see the purple type and the yellow type preferentially connect, right? Again, you'll note that the further away you get, you basically are removing edges in the circular graph because we made this monotonicity assumption. Now, depending on the audience, ever, some people really like this slide, some people hate this slide. I'll, I'll go through it relatively quickly. Um, we solve all of this with MCMC. Um, and so we do full joint inference over basically all of those parameters. And I like MCMC a tremendous amount because it ends up giving me these kind of engineering primitives to work with where I can get inference that I know in some sense is mathematically correct relatively easily. We use these auxiliary variable tricks developed by Radford Neal roughly around um, 2000, 2001 to do inference in these kind of non-conjugate Dirichlet process models. We do slice sampling for the per component parameters and, and grid the hyperparameters. Um, that latter part ends up being important, partly because anytime people try and build these sorts of probabilistic models for finding patterns in data, they tend to actually have problems of sensitivity to the parameter values that you pick. So the right thing to do if you're going to put on your Bayesian hat is put priors over all of them. So you do a lot of MCMC, and at the end of the day, let's see if it works. So on synthetic data, it's easy to feed in synthetic data show that we recover the correct thing and say, hey, look, our curve estimates for type-dependent connectivity match. And in fact, we can do that 
across large numbers of data sets where we'll show that we recover the true number of types, right? Our model, the, uh, the ISRM, infant spatial relational model, recovers the true number, where any of these models that don't incorporate distance tend to terribly over-segment. Same thing if you look at measures like the adjusted RAND index, which is kind of um, how similar to clusterings. And you can even look at the kind of spatial extent of the types that we've found. So again, for, any, if, for a model that doesn't explicitly incorporate distance, it's just going to find lots of tiny little spatially uh, homogeneous clicks, right? But let's move on to the exciting part, the real data. Um, so I said earlier this paper was published in um, the, towards the end of last year. And what it really is, is this connectivity data and this cell body data, right? So the connectivity matrix is here on the right, the locations of the cell bodies. Um, colored by what the authors of the study identified as the neuroanatomically neuro distinct types is here on the left. Now, this is roughly 950 cells. Um, I think they were in a hurry to get the paper out, as, as many of us have been in that bucket, because depending on the metadata part of the public data release that you look at, it's either 950 or 1,100 or whatnot. But we went with the 950 cells that we could readily identify um, an important caveat here is that they were not necessarily able to identify that two cells that are in contact with one another actually have a direct synapse, but rather um, only that these two cells are touching. Um, when they went back and they looked at the, the area of connectivity versus um, the percentage of uh, whether or not there's a synapse, they discovered that there's basically a threshold where if two cells are touching at that area, um, or that, uh, above that threshold, then you know that they actually have a connection with one another. Um, the number of types that they identified, um, there are kind of 50 or five coarse and 80 fine types, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But when we run it through our probabilistic model, we identify that clearly there's this kind of block connectivity structure pulled out from this data, right? So if you start with that original matrix, you can say, well, okay, um, clearly we've at least found something, that there exist types and that the probability of connection appears to matter. And in fact, if you look at kind of our ability to fit those sorts of um, logistic style curves to the distance dependence, ours are in red, the empiricals in blue, the move, uh, curves look pretty good. In particular, um, we can see that at various thresholds, um, we do recover the probability of connection between these types. But that's all fine and dandy. What does it really mean? Well, plotting it like this again, where the inner circle, um, the innermost graph, or the probability of connection between various um, or the probability of connection between various types at this particular distance level. And the next set, I wish I had a red pointer. Um, the next set of dense bars there are the cell, um, um, are the cell body locations, again, organized radially. So ones that are closer are, are closer to the, the cell layer, and ones that are further apart or further apart are further away. Um, and then followed by the synapse density profiles. So and the first thing that I find very striking is that you clearly, in some sense, have, oh, and then the outer ring. So this is always a, it's fun trying to come up with good ways of visualizing these things. Um, the outer ring are the, the five coarse types that the neuroanatomist identified. So the inner colors have nothing to do with the outer colors other than that we needed to have some colors so that we could reference them later. Those are the inner ones. The outer ones you can think of as kind of being like ground truth. And so what you really want to see if you're trying to develop something that's going to find these sorts of patterns in data and agree with neuroanatomists is those outer blocks being roughly homogeneous. Right, which we do see in some groups. There are some like this wedge up here in the upper right-hand corner, which are kind of a mess. Um, but in, we quantify that um, in other parts of the paper. But in general, we see things like, for example, this wedge of entirely red here over on the left-hand um, left side. Those are known to be the retinal ganglion cells. They're the primary output neurons of the retina. And we know that at all spatial levels, they actually connect um, very, very broadly. Right. Um, and in fact, the thing we can do moving on is if we plot each of those types, now this is using our colors again. This is why we need to kind of have our own consistent colors. We can see that the connectivity still remains shockingly dense even as you move further and further away, right? So even at like 60 microns, you still see a lot of this connectivity. But also up here in the upper left-hand corner where that scale bar there is 10 microns, um, our types really do tessellate space. That is, we're not just finding small local clicks. And we can quantify that by saying, hey, look, um, let's look at our spatial relational model versus ground tooth for both coarse and fine types. So we're in the blue here. Ground tooth for coarse types is in black, and for fine types is in um, the dashed line. So adding this distance information, adding this additional metadata actually ends up mattering tremendously. 
And that's exciting because it starts suggesting that, well, as these data sets get bigger, maybe what we're going to be able to do is start bringing these sorts of computational quantitative tools to bear. And the, the, in many ways, the, the dirty secret of, of even this original data set was when it was released, one of the supplemental figures or uh, supplemental PDFs was like, what are the types of these cells that we've identified? And they had kind of the labels they had given them. And then they went and they looked at several review articles and discovered that even these review articles from the past decade disagreed on what various cell types were. Right, disagreed on their morphology, disagreed on their ramifications. And if you start thinking about the importance of things like what is a gene in molecular biology, you can start seeing, well, okay, getting this nailed down computationally, quantitatively, is going to be an incredibly important part of these larger and larger data sets. But then, just for fun, we were like, okay, well, what are other systems that have kind of this sort of computational structure? So we went to the original MOS 6502. There's a great project that's basically tried to do connect home style reconstruction on this chip. Right? And this is the one in the Apple II, or this is the, the original processor in the Apple I. And we discovered that by taking a chunk of the chip, um, what you see over here are the locations of the transistors for the three, uh, for the, the register file area of the chip. Encoding them as each as relations in our model and then running our algorithm, we were able to identify that, guess what? Surprise, there exist different types of transistors in a chip as well. Again, not terribly surprising. Um, but kind of reassuring. And so you can clearly see that the spatial pattern of types over here looks very man-made. And in fact, we pulled out things like some transistors for, are for ALU control, some are clocked, some are running the data bus, some are just grounded, and some are explicitly acting as pull-downs. Another way to quantify kind of how good of a job are we doing is, well, can we actually predict whether or not two cells have a connection based upon the model that we've learned? That is, given our, our particular model in two classes, that's nice. Um, how, much does, how much of this kind of variance can we explain with our model? And we do that with kind of the standard RRC curve. This is in here because most biologists don't understand RRC curves, um, where what we're plotting is the probability of false positive versus true positive, and we have these curves, and we'd like the curves to be kind of closer to 1, 1. Right, so this curve is strictly better. Um, we're also going to use this metric called um, ARI, or adjusted random indexes, how much do clusterings agree? And what you see over here is that in the upper left-hand corner is where we just use the soma depth, or the cell depth profiles. Um, no, the other, one in the upper left-hand corner here is just where we use synapse depth profiles. The one on the lower right is where we use the soma depth profiles. The one on the upper right, because this is what Matt Plotlib gave me, um, is the, um, if we use space and distance, but the one on the lower right, that is the best one, um, is when we combine all of this information. So what you're seeing are the posterior distributions on um, these um, adjusted RAND scores, where you know, we get better and better um, the more information we, agree, we include. That is, we agree closer and closer with what human anat neuroanatomists think the more information we feed in. But then look at, let's look at how predictive accuracy goes here. So we see that predictive accuracy on um, when we include the depth and in synapse information is actually slightly worse, um, ever so slightly worse, than the, uh, when we include um, just distance and connectivity alone. But the neat thing is when you plot our link predictive accuracy versus this adjusted RAND index here, what you see is that what we've really built is a model that does better, uh, that basically sacrifices very little of predictive accuracy to agree or to have parsimonious underlying latent structure. Right, so the red dots are our complete combined model. The blue dots are if we just use distance. Um, the teal dots are a competing model. Um, the green dot is if you just use the connectivity information. So there, but doesn't agree with neuroanatomists, and the link prediction accuracy is pretty poor. Right, so straight up stochastic block model kind of sucks on this data. And then the two dashed lines are um, how much of that variance can you explain when you set the human model when you use the humans clustering either with or without distance, right? So we say, well, I think I, the humans really know what the types are, and so we're getting very, very close to the kind of human level predictive accuracy. So running kind of out of time here, especially since we got started a bit early. In conclusion, I mean, what we're really trying to do is understand the ways in which these neural systems compute, and we're doing that by kind of building these sorts of, of complicated probabilistic models. When we run it on real data, we find that we actually get kind of meaningful results. But this is really just a beginning step, right? So we have a ways to go. In particular, there are lots of additional things that humans can use to identify what constitutes a cell type. 
right? They use mor morphology, they use various genetic markers, these sorts of things. And we have a grant proposal in right now specifically to try and look at that and combine that. One of the reasons I like these kind of generative probabilistic frameworks is at least conceptually, it's easy to include all this additional information. Um, that was that one. Um, there are also different likelihood functions. So we know that there certainly exist areas where uh, cell connectivity dis displays this kind of um, antagonistic behavior, or I'm not going to connect to my neighbors, I'm only going to connect to the cells far away. We'd like to ultimately connect that, combine that into our likelihood evaluation. Inference is slow, surprise, we're using MCMC, I eat like a lot of EC2 cores on this. And one of the things we're trying to do is, well, these data sets are only going to increase. There was another data set published recently with roughly 2,000 cells. We're going to eventually have 10, 20, 50, 100,000. Um, and we have to improve more algorithmically. Our, our attack thus far has kind of been, let's get the model right first and then accelerate. Um, but in some sense, what I feel like we were really looking for here is, is, is this goal. And it might be kind of um, um, us chasing after a unicorn. But we'd really like to kind of use these sorts of probabilistic models to, I don't want to say, automate away a lot of the roles of, of, of neuroanatomists, but more so bring them more into this quantitative era. Um, I think neuro, neurobiology, in particular, kind of computational neurobiology, always is about 10 to 15 years lagging in what the molecular biologists have done. Um, their data sets have kind of gotten here faster. They have kind of a more of a quantitative focus. But the hope is we can get there, too. Um, it's Basically, I think the most exciting biological system out there, you carry one around with you every day. No one really has any idea what it's doing. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity here. So with that, um, oh, and this was joint work with, with my collaborator, Conrad Cording at Northwestern, whom I forgot to mention in the intro slide. And he's been great and actually knew Ben and is kind of how I ended up getting a postdoc here. So, awesome.